Listo, adelante. Listo, ok. Well, good morning. Welcome to MEXIAM, the first plenary talk. It is uh, really a pleasure to introduce you, our first speaker. Uh, is uh, Mauricio Santillana. He is, is uh, 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 Mauricio Santillana is a PhD, is a direct, director of the Machine Intelligence Research Lab in the Computational Health Informatics Program at Boston Children's Hospital. He's an assistant professor at both the Department of Pediatrics, Harvard Medical School, and the Department of Epidemiology, PHN, Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Santillana's research areas include the modeling of geographic patterns of population growth, modeling fluid flow to inform coastal floods, and uh, simulations of atmospheric global pollution transport models, and most recently, the design and implementation of disease outbreaks, prediction platforms, and mathematical solutions to healthcare. His work and perspectives have appeared in journals such as Nature, Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Science Advances, Natural Communications, and Natural, Natural Climate Change, and among many others. Dr. Santillana has advised the UCDC, Africa CDC, and the White House on the development of population-wide disease forecasting tools. His research and perspectives have been featured in a diverse array of national and international news outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Vox.com, Politico, National Public Radio, CNN, BBC, among others. Mauricio has been in the front line of the fight against COVID-19 from the perspective of public health and mathematical models and the interaction of these models with, uh, with uh, machine uh, learning and all these very interesting new things, well, not so new technologies, but that have uh, appeared now and very important and playing an important role in all these things of COVID-19. The talk is going to be 50 minutes. I will warn uh, Mauricio two minutes before, and then we will have 10 minutes of, of, uh, of questions. And without much more to say, please, Mauricio, the screen is yours and the audience is yours. Thank you very much for coming to MEXIAM. Thank you, Jorge, and thank you, Gerardo, and all the organizers of this uh, uh, event for the invitation to uh, talk about my research and all the uh, interesting topics that I think uh, uh, disease outbreaks present to mathematicians. Uh, so first, I'd like to start, uh, uh, you know, highlighting precisely what uh, what Jorge mentioned to us. These are five of the most important um, research areas that I have worked on during my uh, academic career. And I'll be talking to you about the, 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 the latter one, the epidemic outbreaks, uh, you know, surveillance and mitigation. Uh, I want to fully acknowledge the fact that my team is composed of multiple team members. Here are three of them, uh, six of them, and six more. So there are, there are plenty of people that I have collaborated with that have made this work possible. Um, and, you know, I have a broader a range of uh, collaborators uh, that have worked with me on uh, these topics. Uh, specifically, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, show you the kinds of uh, disciplines within applied math that are part of my research on an everyday basis. And as you can see, many of them do not have clear boundaries in the sense that we study differential equations with linear algebra, uh, differential equations with numerical analysis, optimization, etc. So many of these topics are uh, part of my everyday life, uh, and this is mainly for the younger um, crowd who may be joining us today. Uh, and let me get a little bit of background there. Uh, so some of the work that I've done has been possible now uh, due to the availability of data that we are all contributing to uh, by using uh, the internet and owning cell phones that help us navigate our daily lives. And so this uh, field has been called uh, biosurveillance uh, and, and it, is, it is a process of gathering information about our uh, human behavior. Um, and so a lot of companies that uh, run these uh, biosurveillance systems uh, are making their best to uh, increase their profits uh, they use predictive analytics to sell better. Uh, in contrast, what we aspire to do is uh, using the same kinds of data sets and technologies uh, to try to save lives and prevent the spread of diseases. 
Um, and so, you know, specifically in terms of epidemiology, uh, uh, this, these are some of the challenges, challenges that we have. Typically, a decision maker wants to know if an epidemic is about to happen, and if so, how bad it's going to be. And, you know, in real time, we'd like to know to what extent, um, you know, things are getting better or worse according to the diverse either implementation of um, say lockdowns that we have all experienced around the world or the relaxation of them. And so we wanna see if the end result of interventions or changes in human um, behavior lead to the changes that we want to see in terms of minimizing the uh, side effects of epidemic outbreaks. So one of the important tasks that we have at hand is uh, knowing exactly how many people are sick in this very moment. And this is already a challenge given that our uh, traditional uh, uh, healthcare systems um, document uh, case counts for diverse uh, diseases in you know, ways in, that require, for example, laboratory tests to confirm the, uh, the existence of a person who's infected by, by a disease. And you know, these labs take some time, uh, the samples are sent to diverse places, uh, uh, and then eventually a result comes back to the hospital, the hospital aggregates this data, sends the data to local authorities, eventually the national level, and that's when the information is disseminated. COVID-19 has been an exception to this, where uh, this process has been uh, fast-tracked in many ways, and yet, now casting, meaning knowing how many people are affected by a given disease is still a challenge. Um, another task that we might want to know is what will happen in the next few weeks. And as I said before, you know, how bad the outbreak and for how long it may affect a region. Uh, this all, uh, this, this process, this challenge can be solved or attempted to, so, to be solved uh, at different spatial resolutions with different temporal resolutions. So we can go from national to state level to city level, even hospital level. Um, and so this is something that I want to highlight for those of you who may have done, say, data assimilation in the context of weather systems. Uh, the, the difference between uh, the progress that has been made in weather forecasting in the past 50 years, as this uh, plot shows you, is the fact that we have gotten better and better and better at, say, you know, predicting what the temperature will be in 72 hours. You know, the red line there shows, shows us that from 1975 to, say, 2015, you know, we've gone from 25% accuracy to 70% accuracy, whatever that, measure, uh, that measures. Uh, in contrast, if, if we were to become really, really good at uh, predicting disease outbreaks, uh, one would expect to have uh, a feedback effect from the human um, population that's being affected. And that would mean that if we're really, really accurate, uh, and we say in two or three weeks there will be a, a disaster because lots of people are getting um, infected, one, uh, you know, the action of multiple people at the same time could change the outcome and could make the predictions be completely wrong. That doesn't mean that they were wrong to begin with because they could have been uh, correct in the absence of any changes in uh, human um, behavior. So that's just something to keep in mind. And here, here is kind of the diagram of the talk. In a way, I, I wanna show you that we use multiple data streams that are collected uh, in a routine, uh, routinely fashion, um, um, it, it routinarily, uh, and and uh, you know, the, each data source and each approach requires a different modeling or different mathematical model. And so, I'll try to convince you that there's uh, something valuable here to be learned from an applied math perspective. Uh, and so, here I'll present to you before we get to COVID. Uh, you know, the the you know how how we have made uh, progress in monitoring influenza mainly in rich nations as a, a, a launching board. And then from there, I will show you how this can be generalized to uh, low to middle income countries and eventually to COVID-19.
Uh, and so the goal, you know, in our the early days I was involved in this work was to go from this chatter in social media that we see this cloud, this conversation that we're all having to creating uh, what we call in epidemiology, an epidemic curve that basically describes the dynamics of the number of people that are being uh, infected at a given point in time. And so as such, we provide uh, these um, uh, predictions uh, you know, on a weekly basis to the Centers for Disease Control in the US. Uh, and they themselves share these predictions. Uh, what I'm showing you here is in black, what the observed disease activity for influenza at the national level was in the different years. And uh, what, I what I'm showing you in red is the uh, set of four weeks ahead predictions of what we suspected was going to happen. And ideally the black line should fall within the, the cone of uncertainty that we're showing um, in, in the red. And so the, the first uh, portion of the talk will describe, I will describe to you how we do this. Uh, and this is again, an effort that we do in collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control in the US. And then we'll see how this may generalize to other diseases and other locations. And here's a preview on how we do that. Uh, we basically combine multiple data sources uh, and uh, as independent signals and they allow us to uh, perform these uh, predictions in the future of what we expect to happen at multiple spatial resolutions. Uh, so, and then, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about how this can be done in other countries and eventually uh, how this can be applied to COVID-19. And to, to get started on this uh, background, uh, just highlight, I, I I'd like to highlight the, the seminal work uh, by, done by Google. Uh, this seminal work consisted of combining, uh, of really agglomerating the number of people who were searching for flu-related terms uh, back in the days. Uh, this was back in 2008. And they showed uh, both in a paper in Nature and they were highlighted in the New York Times that if you aggregated the number of people who were searching for, uh, say, symptoms of the flu or fever or even like chicken soup as a, as a remedy, uh, if you aggregated all those terms, you would get a signal uh, that changed over time. And that signal or that curve would change in a, in a sim would have similar trends to those observed, observed in hospitalized patients uh, that were showing up symptoms of uh, flu. And so the idea, and this is this is not uh, a plot from Google's flu trends. This is a plot from one of my, my uh, students uh, who uh, conducted her master's uh, degree on this. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a curve in red uh, of the volume of people who were searching for the word bronchitis in South Africa. And in black, you see the number of people that showed up to hospitals with uh, flu-like symptoms. And what you can see is that they, track one another, these two curves, with the interesting fact that the red curve is available in near real time, whereas the black curve has a delay of uh, sometimes weeks. And so knowing the red, one could build a map that goes from the red curve to the black, and that way one could have an estimate of real time um, flu activity in hospitals. Uh, and here's another uh, diagram of uh, how they did uh, this effort in Google. Uh, and here's a summary of the performance of this novel algorithm uh, that uh, you know, led to multiple failures and of course, multiple lessons as a consequence. But the first failure happened uh, a few months after it was first launched in uh, late 2008 uh, because the H1N1 pandemic the, the, um, that you, many of you may remember, um, it hit and the algorithm of Google flu trends uh, failed to capture the presence of this epidemic. Uh, this is the curve they had, and this is what was really happening. And so lots of people were disappointed because they, they thought that this notion of using big data, um, especially data sets that were not uh, designed to monitor disease outbreaks uh, and you know, using that information to basically um, 
not need to do surveillance in the traditional way would be promising. And so this was a big failure. Uh, Google had the opportunity to revise their algorithms. And, and uh, unfortunately, in 2013, they had another big, uh, say, let's call it discrepancy with reality, where they overpredicted by more than 100% the, the level of activity that would happen in the US. So that led to a lot of disappointment and lots of uh, you know, uh, news about how big data was just not going to solve any of our problems. And at the time, with a, a student in applied math at Harvard, we decided to, 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 to check if, one, if we were able to uh, refine their algorithms. And turns out that using some regularization in their, um, in their regression approach and doing some um, dynamic training as in weather forecasting with data simulation techniques, uh, we were able to improve the performance of these, uh, these uh, technological um, tool. Uh, Google acknowledged the fact that this uh, uh, algorithm that we, we were creating, um, that, that we had proposed uh, what was meaningful. They implemented some of our recommendations and eventually they, they wrote a, a, a second paper or a third paper, uh, you know, uh, refining their, their approaches. And, and we, as in any scientific uh, race, we proposed uh, some, something that we thought was even better than the original version. And eventually, unfortunately, the, um, um, sorry. So uh, Google was not getting precisely the results they wanted to get, and they discontinued this tool, giving many people the impression that the whole uh, endeavor of using uh, internet searches as proxies for disease activity was dead. Um, uh, and so, you know, it was all over the news. Uh, but, uh, you know, behind the scenes, we partnered with the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S. and, and with Google, in fact, and they shared data, and we managed to produce uh, a working version of this tool that we, we still use to this day. Um, and, and, you know, we also were interested in seeing if there were other uh, signals that, would, that could be helpful in terms of uh, providing a signal to the, the changes in disease activity in the US for influenza. And we found that the way in which uh, medical doctors search activity on their computers using this specific software called UpToDate and you know, monitoring how many people were reporting on um, apps that ask you every week if you feel sick and also using, for example, volumes of prescriptions for certain drugs uh, uh, that happening uh, that were happening in real time in electronic health records. Uh, those data sources were also very meaningful, and, and and one could potentially monitor flu activity. Again, this was uh, an exercise where the data is is widely available for flu, and and so we were. This was innovative at the time, um, and you know uh, we were excited to present this. Uh, estimates in real time to the Centers for Disease Control at the time. Uh, and at what point there was this question where people were asking, well, what if you have multiple signals or multiple predictions for flu uh, using different data sources, different mathematical techniques to map uh, these data sources uh, onto uh, an estimate of flu, could, you know, should you just be choosing the, the best model and then be done with that, or should you choose something else? And what we showed is in fact that, um, you know, if you combine the uh, using, for example, ensemble approaches or voting systems where, you know, different systems are given different representations, say in a, in a, in a, in a panel of experts, uh, one can improve uh, performance of the models. What I'm showing you here are in each row, uh, you know, the performance in different ways, correlation and error metrics here uh, of different methods that we had at the time. And when we decided to combine all of these methods into a single uh, voting system, we, ma we managed to improve the out of sample correlation with the signal that we were aiming at uh, predicting. And we caught the error dramatically from each individual one. So the lesson here was do not trash the models that do not seem to perform that well, because they may uh, have or they may contain some 
information that's uh, orthogonal to the original signal that the best model may have shown you. Um, and so, you know, we kept making progress on this. Um, and, you know, the next, I guess, the next uh, pro big piece that we feel uh, made a difference was this paper where we not only use these novel data sources in conjunction with one another and these ensemble approaches, but we also started using the synchronicities that were observed when you see an outbreak in a nearby state or a nearby city, the likelihood, or the likelihood that the outbreak will get to you increases dramatically. And so by monitoring how that happens historically, we managed to even improve further our real-time estimates and, and forecasts. Um, and so, let me move fast here uh, to show you here as well that we were using the signal in Twitter uh, to monitor uh, influenza. And again, we wanted to exhaust the possibility of using multiple data sources, multiple. Uh, here we were using natural language processing to detect which tweets could be related to um, disease outbreaks. Um, with some degree of success. Um, and then we decided to uh, move past beyond the national level. And we said, well, could we do this? Uh, uh, sorry, we had done national and state level. And the question was, can we do this in a city where most decisions are actually being made? And so that, that was our next effort. We succeeded, uh, we published this paper and we showed that this, this curve shows you in, in red our predictions uh, that are one week ahead in, in, into the future of the black line. And here you see that, that we were succeeding at uh, getting um, uh, reasonable estimates of what would happen in coming weeks. Um, and so let me skip ahead and let me see if I can get to, uh, well, this, this, this slide shows you that, uh, you know, when I show these uh, slides to the, the, the administrators, administrators at the hospital where I work, Boston Children's Hospital, they wanted to see if we could predict the daily visits of people with influenza-like sim uh, symptoms. And we showed them, uh, you know, after some, um, some steps where we extracted seasonal trends, uh, you know, when there were um, bad uh, snowstorms, uh, and so on, we managed to show, sh show them that our, our prediction systems uh, worked really well. Uh, and then again, just to wrap up the, the, the introduction on the background on, on how we had done this work for influenza, we've, we've also explored the use of uh, neural networks and what people call nowadays deep learning into prediction systems. And we've shown that they can be uh, successful at predicting uh, future disease activity. Um, and we have also moved on, onto the area of using uh, SIR type models, uh, the, these models that use that, the, um, that uh, use differential equations to model the number of people who are susceptible infected, recovered, or dead at a given point in time in our population, they're called SIR models. Um, uh, so we're combining them with, uh, you know, these machine learning approaches. So now we're trying to leverage or squeeze out uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the most, um, uh, or the most useful um, uh, skills of each model into a, a single estimate. And so, so that's kind of the state of the art for influenza. And, and so we decided to move on to see if any of these uh, tools could be used in disease outbreaks in other regions where, of the world where not so much data was available. Uh, and our first uh, attempt was to do this in Latin America, to use the same, uh, you know, disease activity monitoring um, methods using data that was not originally de uh, designed to monitor disease outbreaks for that specific purpose. And we showed that that can be done for certain countries, Mexico, one of them, uh, where one can successfully uh, monitor flu based on the uh, internet search activity uh, of people who are searching for medical information online. Uh, we also showed that it is possible to do that in Africa and certain countries, uh, Algeria being one, uh, South Africa is another one. And then the question emerged, I, you know, this paper, we, we submitted it uh, one or two months before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And what we were uh, um, 
curious, curious about was whether one could use these same technologies where in, in emerging disease outbreaks and what's different between an endemic disease outbreak that comes back every season in a population uh, and, and an emerging disease outbreak like COVID is that emerging disease outbreaks, you don't have any historical data to train these models or to, to, to you don't have a way to learn the patterns from the models. Uh, and, and yet you'd like to see if these data sources could be leveraged for that same purpose. And we showed that for, for some outbreaks like the outbreak of Zika in Colombia or yellow fever in Angola during uh, different years, um, that one could say something, what you're seeing here is that the volume of searches for the word Zika in green, and in gray, you see the, the activity of Zika cases in Colombia with the clear difference that the green line is available in real time and the gray, typically in emerging disease outbreaks, it takes weeks, if not months before people know what's happening on the ground. And so that, that in combination with news uh, uh, alerts, we realized that there was some potential to be done uh, to, to improve this, uh, uh, these methodologies for emerging disease outbreaks. And let me just jump ahead and go directly I, I listed a couple more papers where we did work on dengue in Brazil, but let me just get to, um, let me see. Oh yeah, this is for Thailand. So this is not what I want. Uh, let me get to COVID now, because this is the main topic of the, uh, of the talk uh, and I'm halfway. So here, as many of you know, at this point in time uh, is, is that, uh, you know, COVID, uh, 19 appears as a severe acute respiratory syndrome caused by the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it, uh, it was believed that it came from uh, bats, although as you may have seen in the news, now it is unclear if, he, if it may have been spilled from uh, a lab in China. Uh, and so it's, you know, uh, the community is trying to figure that out and that is important for multiple reasons but what i'm showing you here is that as as of uh january uh, late january as you can see in this video it became apparent that the covid 19 was going to be a big deal and as in february we had seen enough cases that we suspected this would become a pandemic it was not something that we could contain anymore um, and you know so that thus it became really really important to see if we could deploy some of the techniques we had um, designed to monitor disease outbreaks uh, for uh, the rich uh, rich nations we had had the opportunity to to work on plus uh, these other uh, emerging outbreak uh, outbreaks that, that I showed, showed you before and um, I think this was from June 2020 so this is a year ago almost exactly and you can see that the the maps look uh, purple there like a lot of cases in multiple places and if we were to update this uh, map it would look black completely given that every single uh, place on, on earth has been affected in one way or the other um, and but one of the first questions we wanted to learn about was when we saw a map like this this was early I think it, this was probably in April when we saw that there were not many cases reported in in different states but the, diver the, the diversity of localities where COVID-19 was found made us think that it was unlikely that the numbers that we were seeing reported were true. In other words, the likelihood that one would observe such um, complex map in terms of cases uh, implied that there had to be a lot more cases than those that were being recorded. And some of our colleagues, this is work from, from one of our uh, uh, colleagues in Columbia University and some uh, researchers in China, they had already realized that uh, in China, it was very likely that only 14 cases of the total infections, only 14% of the total infections had been reported by their traditional uh, disease monitoring systems. And so we wanted to see if, you know, the iceberg was uh, really big or not, meaning the true number of infections was really high compared to what was being reported. And we knew that this was important because, uh, you know, these uh, 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 mitigation strategies depended on that. And so we wrote a paper uh, basically a year ago, and due to um, 
uh, peer review, as many of you know, it, it was it just became uh, available two days ago or three days ago. Uh, so it's uh, you know I, I really appreciate the rigor in science, but sometimes I feel like we could do a better job at finding out how to make this um, information available earlier. Uh, but the, the the main result of this early paper was that in the first few months, namely four or five months of the pandemic, we estimated that the case counts that were being shared with, uh, you know, in, in, in newspapers and by the CDC had to be, uh, you know, five or 50 times smaller than the actual number of infections that we were seeing in the population so that we could see this very diverse, spatially speaking, pattern of uh, spreading uh, of, of COVID-19. And so uh, basically we used multiple methods, multiple statistical methods to infer the likely number of people who were infected. And I'll show you some just, just so that you, you have some intuition. And what I'm showing you here in black are the, the numbers, and this is a log scale in base 10. And what I show, show you here, let's focus on Alaska, for example, is that the reported cases at this point in time, I think it was April 4th, uh, was say a bit over a hundred, uh, whereas we suspected using some of these methods that I'll describe, uh, you know, we were seeing more than, uh, we were expecting to see 10 times more, at least for, for Alaska, say in this estimate. And, and for many other um, states, let's say, for example, Washington state, uh, we, we estimated using these uh, other methods that the, the number of infected uh, individuals in that place was dramatically larger than those that were being reported. Um, and so uh, one of the ways in which we did this, for example, was by observing uh, so in green, you can see what um, the number of people who were being tested for influenza who had flu-like symptoms were. This is the trend that you were seeing, in, again, in green. And this curve in blue was uh, it described at the time the number of people who were showing in hospitals with flu-like symptoms. So this discrepancy between the number of people who were showing with flu-like symptoms uh, and the number of people who were being tested positive for uh, influenza, you see there's a, a, a discrepancy here. So we started thinking, well, it's very likely that this discrepancy can be attributed to COVID-19 cases. And using those kinds of ideas, we were able to produce this aggregate or cumulative um, uh, infections for COVID-19. Um, and so, uh, that those were our first efforts. A subsequent effort we did was, you know, mimicking those efforts we had uh, developed for flu. And here our goal was to use multiple digital traces or signals to uh, serve as a proxy of uh, COVID-19 activity. Uh, this work involved many people, as I mentioned before. And, uh, you know, the main idea uh, was uh, is captured here. So if you stare at this, uh, uh, you know, um, figure, each of these columns represents uh, the uh, information that was available at different points in time during the early days of the pandemic. So here is what we, we knew in March 1, March 13th, 23rd, 18th, May 30th. Um, and what, we, what you can see, if we focus on this uh, middle or uh, this second row, a uh, second column, is that on the first row, I'm showing you the uh, disease activity that our traditional uh, methods of collecting epidemiological information were showing. So you can see that there was not much of a signal here. There was a bit on the yellow, but it was not really clear. Whereas if you stare at the middle row, where I'm showing you multiple uh, data streams and their change of behavior, we could see, for example, that the number of internet searches that clinicians were conducting, this is uh, in this color, I think it's purple, um, was going up, it's underneath this black line. And so that signal was going up by March 13th uh, in a dramatic and exponential way. It was increasing dramatically. The number of uh, fever, uh, events that were being monitored using uh, Bluetooth 
um, uh, thermometers that sync with your phone and are eventually aggregated in a centralized database, that number was also going dramatically high in an exponential type of way. Um, Twitter, people were tweeting uh, dramatically that they were being affected by COVID. So it was around this time when we, this is this curve is for New York. I have one for Massachusetts as well. This, this is the type of information that we shared with public health officials and with mayors and governors around the US. And we showed them, in fact, by, by March 20, 23rd, you can see that all these data sources that are, again, not designed to monitor disease outbreaks, but were uh, dramatically showing, showing us evidence that people were at least worried, if not affected by COVID, these, all these data sources were going up dramatically. And so we knew that the outbreak was happening and that it was a strong outbreak, uh, again, in the Northeast of the US. Um, and you know it was multiple weeks after the fact that the traditional data sources started showing the real uh, effect of, of this outbreak. And this was the value of this uh, effort. You know, it was a signal processing effort with some Bayesian statistics to uh, assign a risk of an outbreak upcoming in the next few weeks. Uh, and that was the paper. I invite you to, to look at it if you have a chance. Um, and so the, the one thing that we observed, uh, and I'm gonna focus on this slide, is that this, non-traditional data sources could be used to uh, foreshadow or to anticipate increases in, um, and this is at the top one is we call uptrend. That's when the outbreak is starting to go up. And, you know, multiple days into the future. Uh, so when increases in some of these data sources happen, we saw, for example, 10 days after or 20 days after increases in our traditional um, uh, disease monitoring um, quantities, such as number of confirmed cases, number of deaths, etc. So this, we were highlighting the, the potential use of these uh, novel data streams as a proxies for disease activity. Um, and let's see, then, you know, some other things, again, I, I'm highlighting efforts that are in a way disparate from one another, very different, uh, but complementary. And here in this paper, what we focused on is we wanted to know to what extent socioeconomic status in our societies was uh, a determinant of, you know, levels of mortality. And what we, what we saw, as you may be able to see here, so whatever you have, high uh, socioeconomic status here shown in green, uh, we were seeing in absolute numbers that the number of infections and deaths were much lower. Whereas in the lower areas here, one can see a lot more incidents and a lot more deaths uh, in the poorer uh, regions of, this is for specifically Santiago de Chile, the capital of Chile. And what one can see in these curves, for example, is that if one stares at the reduction of mobility, so the, the governments decided to implement lockdowns where people were asked to stay home, uh, in areas that are green, uh, you know, the reductions in mobility were dramatic. They could afford to stay at home and have their food delivered and not be outside, whereas people in poorer areas, you know, the, the degree to which they could reduce their, um, their human mobility, and this is data obtained from mobile phones that monitor your location, as you all know, whenever you use a phone and you, 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 you click accept, 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 this is one of the things you're accepting, is that they are monitoring where you are. Um, and so this, these curves are uh, here at least, I feel like they're being used for the right um, reasons or with the right uh, motivation, right? Um, and then finally, the um, let's see. Well, so this is a bit of a summary of this paper, even though it's a lot more uh, uh, rigorous in many ways, but just wanted to highlight some of these findings. Um, and then we also uh, showed combining SIR type models with uh, human mobility information from phones that if, restrictions had not been imposed. And this is a paper we wrote for uh, to assess the effect of lockdowns or they are also called non-pharmaceutical interventions or I guess non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, you know, can 
mean a lot of things, but specifically we were looking at um, uh, changes in human mobility as recorded by mobile phones. And so here, the, what we showed is that if the, these lockdowns had not been implemented, you know, the number uh, of, of infections that would have resulted would have been dramatically higher, exponentially larger than what was observed in China. And at the time, we felt that was a, a lesson that all countries could learn from. But as you know, and we showed in Chile, this is not always easy for people to uh, uh, observe, given that not always people can stay at home. Uh, because of their economic needs. Um, and so, um, you know, the, in this paper, uh, again, this is a very panoramic perspective on, on our work, but we were trying to show that the same types of approaches that we had used before, where we combined data sources in, in China, the, the equivalent of Google is, uh, is called Baidu. Uh, the, the searches on Baidu were um, really uh, uh, good estimates on um, disease activity. And we show here that, you know, the, the predictions that we were obtaining with our machine learning approaches could be leveraged for, um, uh, you know, to monitor uh, COVID-19 outbreaks in China as well. Um, and let me see here. Uh, and then we were also very interested because this was uh, an important question at the time when, when the outbreak was starting was, to what extent when temperatures would increase and humidity would increase, the, uh, the transmission of COVID-19 would decay. And here, the idea was very similar to what people do for flu. And what you see in this curve, you see on the y-axis, uh, the, the quantity R0 or R0, which in a way is a proxy for how many people get sick uh, after one initial case um, has been introduced in a population. So the number two would say that if you have one individual who's sick in a population, on average, you would expect two to be uh, infected after that. And then as you can see, if those two go and uh, transmit to two more each, then you start seeing this exponential growth that we have uh, witnessed in COVID-19 times. Uh, and this curve, what, what, what's shown here is that for influenza, the, the higher the, the, the specific humidity, which is a proxy for not only humidity in the air, but also temperature, uh, the, the, the higher the transmission. And the logic here is that uh, droplets can leave suspended in the air uh, for longer time periods if there's uh, less humidity because the droplets or the aerosols that are floating in the air um, do not collide with uh, humid particles or water particles. And so, because when they do, they may fall to the ground. And so the, the longer they can be suspended, the more uh, COVID could in principle survive. And so people use the influenza, uh, this influenza plot to show, to, to as, as intuition for what would happen, what would happen for COVID, uh, multiple uh, presidents, including the Chinese president and the U.S. president, said, "Don't worry, this pandemic will go away, uh, because you know it, once it gets uh, uh, warm and humid, um, it will die out." Uh, and so, let me jump directly. So this is this curve is expected to. So the goal was that this curve should look the same as this one that the smaller specific humidity, the higher the transmission rates would be, and the higher the humidity, the smaller the transmission rates would be. Uh, but when we when we stare at this plot, and this is, or this is temperature, so this is um, absolute humidity. Yeah, so if you stare at the curve on the, oops, on the left, so let's let's focus on this one. Uh, we, we would have expected to see this decay and then this, uh, plateau here. And what we were showing is that, in fact, for COVID-19, there was a temperature around here. And I think that that was um, around, well, this hump you see it here in the temperature, it was around um, 200, it was probably like um, four or five degrees where transmission of COVID appeared to be maximal. Uh, but the worrisome part of things is that as uh, humidity was increasing here, the, the transmission was not decaying. And so 
you know, in prison, as I said, one, one expected to see this behavior and it was, it looked pretty much flat. And so we started warning multiple governments around the world uh, saying, you know, we have, uh, at least from the evidence we have, prov provinces in China and, and even countries like Singapore are having outbreaks, even in weather that has like 25 to 30 degrees Celsius uh, with really high humidity. So one should not trust that this pandemic will stop in the summer. And we knew this by March and yet, you know, multiple countries chose to ignore this um, and eventually um, saw the, the consequences of, of not uh, being aware of this. So I realized I, I flew through my slides and I've reached the end uh, of, of what I prepared. Um, so I would be happy to take any questions. And so um, now uh, in principle, uh, Jorge, no need to give me a warning. I'm happy to go back to any of the slides if there's interest, um, but um, I'm happy to take uh, questions now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mauricio, for a very, very interesting tone and very actual topic. And uh, if there are questions, you can write them, please, in the Q&A section. Or I wonder if we could have an open microphone for the two questions that we have. No sé si pudiéramos tener la, el micrófono abierto para las preguntas de Jonás de Basada y Miguel Ángel, a los técnicos. ¿Se puede? Bueno, mientras recibimos respuesta, while we receive an answer, let me... Perdón, uh, eh, put... Sí se puede. Sí se puede. Entonces... Eh, Jonás, por favor, si pudieras hacer tu pregunta en vivo. Jonás. No, bueno, ah, eh, Jonás, si nos oyes. Muchas felicidades, Mauricio. Me da mucho gusto verte y escuchar tu plática y es muy interesante todo lo que estás trabajando. Eh, pues la pregunta que había planteado aquí cuando vi las correlaciones de las búsquedas de Google con otros parámetros, <risa> Pues la primera pregunta que me surgió fue si, si se normalizan las búsquedas o, o se usan así en, en valor absoluto. Te, te agradezco, Jonás, y me da mucho gusto verte o escucharte al menos. Eh, eh, ¿crees, cree, eh, Jorge, ¿crees que sería apropiado que eh, tuviéramos una conversación en inglés o en español? Está bien. Uh, yes, English. Okay, so for, 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 for everyone who's, uh, who's uh, following us in English, uh, we, we want to keep your attention and we want to keep you part of the, of the talk. And Jonas, would you like to repeat your question in English? Yeah, by all means. So Mauricio, congratulations. I'm, uh, uh, for this work, it's very relevant and it's very interesting, very in-depth. So a uh, question that comes to mind when I see the Google search data correlated with other parameters. My question is, do you have to normalize the search data or is it used in absolute values as it is? Yeah, so that's a great question. And this is something that Google had to deal with. Originally, the, they created a single variable, a single input variable, or as statisticians call it, a single predictor. And the, the way they, 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 uh, they constructed this predictor, uh, Jonas, was by aggregating everything in, in its raw numbers, in absolute numbers. And so they would add the number of people who were searching for the word influenza or uh, tissues or Kleenex or, you know, all, all those uh, keywords are, that are flu related. They very rapidly, uh, uh, after the, the first failure they had, they realized that that was not the way to go. So they started normalizing. Uh, and, and in fact, what we, we went further and we realized that it was not only normalizing the number of flu-related Google searches with respect to the total, but also one needed to be ready to see that certain Google searches were very predictive at some point in history, but they may lose their relevance. And they may lose their relevance for multiple reasons, but one of them was that the Google search engine was being changed. And, and Jonas, you and I are old enough to remember that back in the days, one would type out a keyword and Google would give you a, a, a search result. But nowadays, if you start typing two or three letters, Google starts guessing what you're going to ask. And so that definitely led to changes. So, so 
perhaps a term that people were used to typing before. Now that Google is trying to, 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 to guess what you want, so that term may not be as relevant for Google for, for influenza prediction, if, you, if, if that makes sense in your mind. So in other words, there were many things that were changing with the search engine and the way in which people search for medical information online. And so the, the models needed to be dynamic as well. So, so yeah, I don't know if I, I probably, I, I hope I answered your question and I hope I didn't uh, say too much. I'll stop. Anas, you have any comment on that or we pass to the next question? That was a great answer because you in fact answered my question and the next question that I was wanted to ask. So thank you. Awesome. Great okay. to hear from you, Jonas. Yeah. Uh, the next question is Miguel Angel's question. Will you please open the microphone for Miguel Angel to Miguel Angel to make his question? Miguel Angel. Uh, thank you. Well, we thank very much uh, Professor Santiana for this excellent talk. Uh, I have a, a small question. You know, you mentioned in social networks, for instance, Twitter. Sometimes you you may see the keyword. But the keyword is uh, prefer is, is has to do with something else. So maybe so my question was: uh, Is there information that may possibly be incorrect, and how do you filter? Yeah, it's a great question, Miguel. There are people who spend their careers on that question, so it's a, it's a meaningful one. The 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 way in which we use uh, Twitter, for example, um, is so we. First, as you your intuition tells you, we find the keywords to identify the space of tweets that may be useful. And then we do natural language processing to uh, extract subclasses of tweets. For example, tweets that have the word I or my or so, something like that, that refers to the first person, either in singular or plural. And then something that may be related to symptoms or so, so that we may filter uh, the those tweets that say I am sick, my mother is experiencing fever, uh, those kinds of tweets, right? Like so, those that creates a subclass of tweets that uh, create a signal, uh, and then we we you know we become creative and use natural language processing for sentiment analysis, etc. And with like combining multiple, let's call them business rules we identify which uh, time series that are generated this way may be uh, predictive of flu activity. So, so yes, we need to filter a lot. And uh, frequently we end up with a f a very um, noisy signals depending on the spatial resolution. So some of these methods work well for like the tweets, for example, they're good at state level in the US, but not very good at uh, smaller cities. Did that make sense, Miguel Angel? Yeah, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we have time for more questions. If you want to do, do, do some, have some questions, please write your name in the Q&A and we can give the clue to the technicians so they open the microphone. So please, uh, uh, while we have more questions, Mauricio, I have one question quick on the Chilean study. Yeah. And it was a very clear difference between the poor section and the rich section, but I wonder about the, if the impact of comorbidities. I do not know the, 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 the distribution of comorbidities in the Chilean population, but here in Mexico and probably in the United States, we have a serious problem of obesity, of hypertension, of diabetes, and how that those factor mix with the social status. What is the what is the relation? Is there a relation? Is this yes. so clearly separated or is more? There is a relationship. Uh... Jorge, and as you have a good intuition for, um, so poorer um, uh, populations may suffer from higher uh, rates of uh, certain um, comorbidities that are associated with more deadly outcomes. Um, and so, but even controlling for that social, uh, socioeconomic status came up as a as a determinant of, of mortality and cases, but you're right that it, it, it is definitely a factor that makes uh, that becomes an important predictor of mortality, uh, given that uh, indeed you know more people smoke, more people are obese, more people are diabetic uh, or have heart problems, and though all those comorbidities, I'm 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 choosing them carefully because they 
uh, you know, combined with COVID-19, they have been uh, some of the leading cause of death uh, or complications. So, so yes, uh, they, they show up, uh, but even controlling for them, socioeconomic status emerges as a, an important uh, determinant, uh, Jorge. Thank you, Mauricio. Are there any more questions? Uh, there is one, there is one. Graciela Herrera, please, uh, 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 if you could give her the, the microphone. Graciela Herrera. Graciela del Socorro Herrera. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the research uh, your group did on the possibilities of using other sources of information like, like Google searches uh, in other countries like, uh, like Mexico. Could you expand on your conclusions? Yes, yes, definitely. So what we have seen is uh, in the past 20 years, uh, we have, an in have uh, observed, Graciela, an increase in, in the number of uh, people who can access the internet, and many of them, because of the because of the way the giants have monopolized, uh, you know, the use of internet, many people will use Google. You know, especially if you have an Android phone. In even even in poor uh, areas, people are now not buying computers, but they do have access to smartphones uh, <laughs> frequently, and so what. The limitations that we were, were observing, say, in the 2010, 2000, uh, all the way to 2015, you know, where that, uh, you know, internet penetration was an issue uh, for these techniques to work. But we realized that once you hit 30 or 40 percent of internet penetration in an area, then these proxies can be very useful in assessing at least what people fear about a disease and how many may be affected. So um, the more we look at this, and even in Africa, we have looked at some countries um, in, in Africa that uh, some years ago, the signal was not there, but nowadays um, the you know companies like Facebook and, uh, and Google have expanded internet access. And, and so people are now using their phones uh, to use to, to search for information, and you know, because another another reason we were concerned was uh, literacy in in many countries. Because if people do not know how to read or write, you know, you couldn't uh, extract signals. But the the interesting fact is that even though the sample that you get from just those people who can read uh, uh, or, or write um, and that can afford a phone, that signal, since they are well weaved into the population, any increase on disease activity in these uh, groups will, will, will be a good proxy for, uh, in, in other words, the trends are valuable. I don't know, Graciela, if I answered your question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have time for a short, quick question, if you have. If not, you can, to do that, you please write your name in the Q&A and then I will, in, uh, send the message so they open the microphone. Uh, if there are no more questions, then I guess we thank very much for a very, very interesting talk, Mauricio. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you all for attending this first plenary uh, session of the MechScience uh, Congress. And uh, we have a coffee break, I understand, of half an hour. And then we start again with the parallel sessions, please. Keep in touch, go to them, and thank you very much to all. Thank you, Mauricio, and thank you to everyone. See you around. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Jorge and Gerardo. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.